Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this morning's episode. Okay, let's get into this. So today's episode is probably going to be shorter than usual, uh, but there, an idea struck, uh, kind of struck me out of nowhere, visited me that I, I feel I have to share, and it's, it's kind of an uh, additional insight I've received about how to manage the relationships of the moment with its objective sense of being and also with its subjective. You see, if we choose to be a point of reference, that point of reference will be the center of the world. In other words, this, you can say the central core of your first personality is the first conscious memory of being a person. That means the eyes were there to record something. Now that is that in memory, the earliest memory of selfhood is where all this reality revolves around in meaning because fundamentally we're saying we're a person throughout the day and we're living our life and we're going around <laughs> and all these things. <clears throat> However, it's a, it's a kind of very interesting way of seeing things when before the objectivity moves, there is an experience of subjectivity or after objectivity moves, there is an experience of subjectivity. <clears throat> the management is very difficult because every instant in this living moment where there's change, it's like the rug gets pulled under from under your feet. Expectations of the mind are not always met by the body. And so the in some sense, we are a part of the world that can see itself in ways that don't exist objectively. Now I find the 
biggest kind of confrontation. You know, have you heard that saying where they say uh, everybody on this planet, every human being on this planet is fighting a war you cannot see, which is an implication of their inner reality's ability to interpret chaos or to give it a position of meaning in the story of life. Uh, I became much more curious about the structure of metaphysics, the design of metaphysics, rather than the implication of metaphysics. <clears throat> what that means is that I saw the physical reality, and I'm like, if I wonder about the unknown, my imagination can literally stretch this manifest world in many directions. But why is the world in one way? In some sense, why is the manifest reality expressing itself in this way? The questions of the seeker of any sort, if the seeker is seeking some sort of truth to the experience, let me tell you where it will lead the person. The questions about life, the deep questions about life, will lead you to the mirror of existence. It's like your existence... Uh, has an empty root it's like the roots of existence are in non-existence so existentially when you consider reality it's just kind of like how the space is here to hold it and experientially it's the passage of a space in an attention the relationship that we have with a camera and stuff moving in front of it when the director is filming <clears throat> that is very similar to how consciousness is, but consciousness is a camera that gets the vis visuals itself. It's aware of what it is filming. You know, that is the uh, fascination of the human intelligence. We are alive and aware in ways many creatures on this planet are not. This either means <clears throat> something happened to us or we came here first. It's kind of like one of those situations where, uh, think of it this way, if there is a sort of transcendentalism at work in this reality, and the theories of uh, that this world is a sort of simulation, a sort of holographic, it has a holographic nature, eventually the person will have to ask the deep questions. You know, me, me giving these talks, it's not that, it, it, <laughs> I'm just bringing it up earlier. It's kind of like, Let me share something very insightful. Um, I consider this to be a very important thing to note, especially for all those people who have in some sense been raised with religious context in the environment. For me, uh, the notion of God, it was introduced with an ultimate importance. Many children being raised in religious circles, uh, when I say religious circles, environments where there is a sort of religious law in the social law. Literally, the environment is even listening to that uh, code of language. Now, <clears throat> The thing is that when something is given importance, it stays in your attention longer. Anything you care about stays in your attention longer. And the issue with this life is kind of the attachment, literally equating freedom to just stuff that's in your attention in one moment of being. It's very hard to speak about a changing world. Because the words will kind of be empty by nature. By the nature of change. <clears throat> so this management, does it mean we intellectually tame ourselves and evolve? It kind of means we use intellect, in the intellect as a technology and see how far we can go. 
where we see our limits, sometimes the person has to uh, find a shortcut or find, in some sense, uh, uh, they've kind of walked into the wrong street and have to climb out. <clears throat> in this life, if I could kind of very playfully suggest this, as a human being, I have climbed onto many ships of ideology and also stepped out of many ships. And eventually, what happens is you build your own ship. What that means is that you begin <clears throat> becoming, in some sense, a master of language. You become an observer of it. And this is kind of the the core of this talk today, you know, that in some sense the mind, the ancient said, it, it's a lousy master, it's a great servant. What the, what is the, and what does the mind kind of? How does the mind present itself? It presents itself as a story, as a character in a story, a character in a story preserved by the abstraction of language. So language is keeping us as a are keeping our, is it's kind of like the pillars of our free will if it wants to be animate uh, through the intellect. <clears throat> so if the, lang if the mind appears as language, as imagery, and as I additional imagery and language of uh, to the moment, that means like you're experiencing a moment of existence, but alongside this existence, there's many subjective modes of how the individual is here. <clears throat> the thing is, the mind uh, is trying to be ever-present. Your mind is kind of trying to replace God. But what God is, is, is the attributeless, is the unknown. So when the mind becomes a servant, it means the language, the subjective content, does not define the experiencer. You literally uh, step out of the, you know how Tony Stark stepped out of the Iron Man suit to go party or whatever? Similarly, you step out of the linguistic simulation. You step out of uh, a sort of fixed conditional reality and begin to experience life if before you were experiencing uh, reality, the state of consciousness was just formulating things in a solid way. That means your sense of what is real was based on information alone. It shifts from that. It's kind of like you go into a liquid state and eventually go to a gas state. These are phases uh, of the experiencer where behind your eyes, the notion of an individual like a caterpillar with many identifications, many lifetimes, many incarnations, so considered, many impressions, many sanskara. <clears throat> From this vastness of individuality, it goes through a metamorphosis into a collective nature. So that's kind of something that I'm, it's not being said much. The notion is not that the person should believe in God. <laughs> You know, you can believe in anything if you want. You know, you can, it's like that's, that's the whole notion that it is when it comes to believing the unknown, that's when reality cannot be shaped anymore. And it's a very important moment because it is apocalyptic to the memory structure, as if you have kind of been conditioned and your memories all make sense, all have a sense of reality, a reference of story. But this is eventually when the mind begins to generate phenomena itself as a phenomena that is no longer dependent 
that is no longer dependent on the, in some sense, <clears throat> it's no longer dependent on uh, the external change. So what if externally you are having the experience of a temporary changing individual, but behind your eyes you're having the collective experience of an eternal attributeless uh, movement? I honestly don't know how civilization will evolve beyond the language threshold. I feel for the next couple thousand years, uh, not couple thousand, but maybe for like the next thousand years, we will not be able to, it's going to be very complex to let go of language when our meaning is defined by it. Uh, what that implies is either there's going to be in some sense a new language, we're going to, I personally theorize, this is my personal hypothesis, Mr. Rufin's personal kind of theory that I, I feel there's going to be the emergence of geometry as the language of all languages. That means every language in existence will have a geometrical interpretation. And eventually we're going to see that this geometrical interpretation, it, it also has a sort of actual image interpretation. Like when I say like an apple fell from a tree, there is a sort of image we see. Okay, but when I say a geometrical language, it's like imagine you seeing a shape of geometry and instantly knowing an apple fell from a tree. So that's another level of sophisticated language development that we find in ancient times was utilized, but in modern times it wasn't. The thing is that the relationship of all phenomena with you is kind of like echoing all over the place. The mind uh, originates the personality as waves, and it has to do with the attention. Right. If I ask you, uh, imagine you're someone with a lot of problems. Now, uh, this person, imagine you go and ask this person, with, let's say there's a person with a lot of problems. You go and ask this person, and you're like, hey, man, I see you have a lot of problems. Can I ask you a question? When you are in deep sleep, legit when you've slept and you're in deep sleep, literally nothing, it's like that blankness before you wake up. <clears throat> Is there any problem? Are there any problems? And you see, no, it is only in the scope of our attention. This is why reality, when it gets too intense, rather the person thinking that they have to confront that intensity, the whole notion is you kind of s slow down the speed of the thing. Sometimes when I have too many problems, I, I move towards stillness. It's like because my attention needs to see the field again kind of like a general where the soldiers went to the battlefield and it's like their tactic wasn't good and they've retreated and now the general's like, okay, what's going on now? And is thinking of the whole setting. You are in some sense resetting your mind by realizing it is changing automatically. You know? <laughs> <clears throat> the thing is, human beings, they society is kind of like an indirect attempt <coughs> society is like an indirect attempt at the ultimate you know and the first attempt hasn't been good it's as if like we were like these savage animals and in a long span of time, we suddenly decided to be more civil. But now our civ civility is not that civil, and it's bringing up challenges where the philosophical minds of the time are like, okay, if we create a utopia, will people be satisfied? If we create a dystopia, will people be satisfied? In some sense, there is a sort of impossibility. You know, there's the, um, I'll, I'll, let me explain to you what I mean. Uh, there's the story of the Tower of Babel. It, literally the Tower of Babylon. The Tower of Babylon is the story that all of humanity gathered around in one place. And they were like, okay, we're going to build a tower to the heavens. It's like, why do the, only the gods get to see it, how life looks like from above the clouds? We shall too. And so all human beings, all of humanity, <clears throat> was united under one language and their management and efficiency was so, was so incredible 
that they began actually building this tower. And this tower went so high because of the efficiency of human beings. That at some point, one of the gods was like, this is madness. Why are these beings climbing up? I'm going to break their tower with lightning. And in that second, another god came and said, hey, man, let me, let me show you a classier way to take care of the situation. And what that god did was he, instead of uh, smiting the tower, the greatest achievement of man, breaking it, it, it separated, it made human beings not be able to speak the same language. The instant they could not communicate each other, it's as if one mirror had been shattered into many. One reflection of a species had shattered into many individual modes where from the eyes of each person there came their own world. <clears throat> the design of the human being is a suggestion that nature wants, uh, not the design of just the human being, the invention of language, the discovery of, of linguistic modes of existence. Language exists to communicate man's inner reality. Man will communicate his inner reality when a reality is actually safe enough and comfortable enough. The issue is that we all have very luxurious desires as a species nowadays. Because we have luxurious desires, we identify with senses of self we want to be rather than actually being people in the moment seeing the world. It's as if many people are living in the world, yet if you ask them where they are, they are in the future. They want to achieve. You know, and it's kind of like this whole <clears throat> kind of artificial spirit of hard work gets you the right thing. But the issue with hard work is that if the system is flawed, it doesn't matter how hard you work, you're not going to get there. Okay, so it has to do with the engineering of the system. It has to do with an awareness that you, with the individual literally needs data that they don't have to see the picture in a different way. I feel technology is taking over the imaginative powers of the human being. I feel what we should have discovered naturally, we are in sen some sense inventing artificially. Rather than adjusting to the nature of the world, we tried to escape it. And in doing so, so there came a cost. There came a sort of amnesia, a sort of forgetfulness. <coughs> this, is, this is another topic. <clears throat> incredibly for debate where people are like what is this when you look at a baby deer being born the baby deer it's as if it automatically knows how to run and stuff it's strange it's as if its genetics allow it a sort of memory of how it should move but when we look at the human being we don't see that genetic component as if the human being has to be nourished and taken care of and so the structures of civility are kind of making a crib rather than in some sense a forest you know and so it's very fascinating for me. Yeah, I, not that it's a bad thing. I, these things I'm saying, it's only a limited mind that has to have something be good or bad. Uh, I find higher levels of reality are comprehended simply as an attributeless design, observer of design. You don't really have an identity when you move beyond the, uh, any sort of dualistic frame. And language is kept in a dualistic frame. And what a dualistic frame means, it means the good and the bad, everything that is in some sense codependent, you know? It's like you go look at the best person on the planet, and you go look at the worst person on the planet, and you see they have something in common, even though they're completely de different. They are both extremes of, you know, their game. I find that um, 
chaos should be moved internally and in some sense efficiency should be moved externally what that means is imagine you're in a moment throughout the day and you see something inefficient happen and I recommend the species to stop using uh, uh, like you never the thing is the whole species doesn't understand the concept of teaching the concept of teaching is to be more like a mirror rather than to just be a sort of <clears throat> programmer of another person's mind it doesn't work that way without freedom life cannot be alive literally free will would make no sense it is still conditional we are we are trying to be free of something but we ask ourselves what and we see that it's the world but we ask ourselves where does the world come from and we see it comes from how we have accepted that definition into a sort of subjective position and so how we have painted reality into meaning behind our eyes will suggest that how deeply we will be fascinated by the world we see and so there is something important here because in yogic thought they say the highest states the most enlightened yogis are like children and I was like what <laughs> I remember you, you're like hearing that concept and I was like what is this what do you mean like children and I, re I soon realized the implication is that it has a freedom of a reality see it, it's the difference is a sort of leap of climb of maturity you know the person goes from order like the child imagine it's just in an ordered state everything's fine it grows up suddenly holy shit life's more chaotic than I believe and so the person sees chaos and when the person sees chaos <clears throat> when the person is bomb uh, the person experiences a sort of chaos then the person attains the order even though the chaos is there, that order has a maturity with it, which is kind of like a round circle. It's as if you were a child and then you thought you had to be something and run into the world. And as you ran into the world or something, you're like, man, I just want to play. <laughs> you just want to chill. And so the thing is, we are human beings where the moment we can make our, the, the amount of time we spend in our luxury efficient, that's when civilization will take a turn because human beings are running towards luxury. They all want to live easier rather than live with the challenges of the world. Right now, if humanity was under attack, you know how many people would avoid it, would avoid the species under attack? Joining the military has, has a different motive, you know? A person fights only because they feel they can win. A person who feels they, can, they can't win they may fight, but in some sense, they may fight with hope, but if there is no hope, then the person will not fight. And so that's the issue of civility, uh, the issue of our civilization, that the behavior of human beings, there's a value system at work. <clears throat> this value system is kind of like an external common hierarchy, but this hierarchy is being interpreted by everyone's mind differently. The poor people look at the people in power and like, what are these assholes doing? And the rich people look in the people on this power and they're like, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I feel life, its meaning has to change. And because it changes, it doesn't have, it either it doesn't have a meaning or it doesn't have one meaning. And with that implies the sort of multidimensionality we find in the conscious journey. Just the notion of consciousness is even a multidimensional conscious concept because there's the dimension that is unconscious and there's the dimension that is conscious. The notion of life and death is in some sense a dualistic concept. But you see, what is one concept that is not dualistic? And that's where we find the words enlightenment, the words, uh, the truth of all truths, the soul of the soul, da, 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 God, you know, like there's many, many symbols you can put for the ultimate, but the ultimate will always be attributeless to the limited because the limited will not accept the ultimate until it is different than it. You see the issue? <clears throat> the issue is imagine like God's within you, but you're looking for it outside. 
you know, let's say truth is within you, you're, when you're looking for it outside, you go, you finish after eons of looking outside, you're like, okay, let me look inside. And when you go, <laughs> when you go to actually look inside, what you find is a sort of dissolution into the presence of nature. There is no sort of spirituality, ladies and gentlemen. There's just the presence of nature, and it's raining too much right now, and I have to go inside. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, guys. Much blessings and namaste. And one thing I'll leave you with. The only way to truly comprehend the meaning of a changing world, pretty much the task of the lifetime is to discover the true nature. And once the true nature is discovered, the relationship of be the being with the world will be in a way where confusion cannot exist because it's the f it's a field of intelligence moving the individual rather than an individual having to move the world. You want to move the world, you can, but it'll, it's going to tire you out. <laughs> it's just going to be too heavy. In front of our eyes, we are what is here. Behind our eyes, we are what is here. And when what is now here becomes nowhere, and suddenly nowhere also becomes now here, the inseparability of all ideology will be found in the attention that keeps them all afloat. I hope this talk has served you. Much blessing.